you believe God, y'all didn't hear me, is intentional. That there's nothing that happens to us by happenstance, but rather that God is in fact intentional. Say intentional. So whatever we go through, whatever cursed in our lives, God is intentional in that. And I'm sure that there's some of us who would say, I'm not so sure if God is intentional because there's certain kinds of things that are happening in my life that doesn't seem to be working for my good. And sometimes there are those moments in our lives that we wonder whether or not God intended for a certain kind of a thing to occur in our lives. Have you ever felt like that? Certain kinds of things came your way. Certain kinds of issues occurred in your life. There were even certain kinds of problematic people who came into your life. Have you ever had any problematic folk in your life? Just turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, that's you he's talking about. Problematic people who have certain kinds of diseased, not bodies, but attitudes. Have I got a witness in the house? Yes, it is true that there are certain kinds of people who are contagiously bad for you. But somehow God allows those people to come into your life. Thank God they, they, that they come and they go. Have I got a witness in, in the house? It is true that there are some people who just draw on you. Do you know any folk like that? There's some folk that, 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 that you draw from, but there's other folk who just draw, uh, draw out of you. But somehow God is still intentional. But there are those times to which we are like Jesus in our garden of Gethsemane when we are facing our crucifixions and our crosses, the angry mobs and the angry crowd, and we... We kind of pull back for just a moment, but then when we finally discover that life is not in our hands, but rather life is in the hand of God, we say the prayer like Jesus said, not my will, but thou will be done. You know, this issue of intentionality is found in the gospel as recorded by St. John. St. John is in fact the writer of this book of St. John, the 11th chapter. And it reflects back upon one particular incident in the 11th chapter. He opens that chapter up by saying in the Message Bible, a man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister, Martha. John clarifies who this Mary was by saying in the Message Bible, the second verse in the 11th chapter, this was the same Mary who massaged the Lord's feet with aromatic oils, then wiped them with her hair. It was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. It, it opens up with Jesus, who has three people that he is in love with. He loves these three people. And some would suggest that he loved them because of who they were. They were not only wealthy people. They had to have been wealthy people because when Jesus was in one particular house, it is this Mary who anoints his feet with this precious oil. You remember that, don't you? She unties her hair and she begins to anoint his feet with her hair washing, in essence, with this very expensive perfume. And so Mary and Martha and Lazarus was a very wealthy family. I wish I could get this across. They were wealthy. But they were not too wealthy to withdraw their wealth from Jesus. They were not too wealthy to hold back anything that they had that they could not commit and dedicate to Jesus. And the truth of the matter is that he would go to these wealthy people house in Bethany. He, he loved Bethany. Say, loved Bethany. 
Because this was the place where he could retreat. This was the place that he could go away and go aside. This is the place that he could refresh himself. Say refresh himself. This is a place that he could go out and hide out. It was a kind of quiet place. And what I believe is that everyone ought to find them a place of quietness. A kind of place of retreat somewhere where they can get away and be to themselves. A place away from all the noise. Uh, after all, that's what President Barack Obama did. After eight years, he got away from all this stuff. Got away from all the critics and criticism. Got away from all the hard work. Got away from all the things that he was called to do, in essence, as president. And he, and he gets himself away out of the White House, he and his lovely wife, Michelle. And they go to the home of a friend, like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They go to a billionaire house, Richard Bransom's Island, Necker Island, to get away uh, to ski, to water ski, and and do all of those kinds of things just to get themselves a break after eight years. Everybody needs a place of retreat. I wish I had a witness. Everybody needs somewhere that they can get away from all the noise of the world, all the issues that are. Everybody needs a place of retreat. Why, I even know, I even believe that Trump needs a place of retreat. Yes, he has a place of retreat called Mar Logo. A resort, you know, he goes there all the time. In fact, he goes there more than he does working in the White House. He's always there in Palm Beach, Florida, in his own hotel place, retreating. And so, the truth of the matter is, all of us need a place of retreat. Retreat. We need a place to unwind. And for Jesus, it was this little home in Bethany of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But something tragic happened in this little village of Bethany and John the disciple tells us what happened there in this little village of Bethany say little village of Bethany yes they tell us what happens in the little village of Bethany in the book of John he says a man was sick Lazarus of Bethany the town of Mary and her sister Martha this was the same Mary who massaged the Lord's feet with the aromatic oils and when and then wiped them with her hair it was her brother Lazarus who was sick say Lazarus was sick and so they understood they understood what you do when you're sick the text says in verse 3, so the sisters sent word to Jesus. I could just park right there. Is there anybody in the house ever been sick? Is there anybody in the house had some bad health issues? Is there anybody in, in the house who did not understand which way to go, needed their mind regular? Is there anybody who had a family member that was sick? Here is what John says that these women did. The text says, so they sent word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could park right there. They sent word to Jesus. You know, we used to sing that song, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Do I have a witness in the house? Because he's my best friend. He was a friend to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so when Lazarus was sick, the text says that the sisters sent word to Jesus. And here is what they say. They say, Master, say, Master, the one you love so very much is sick. Now, now you have to park right there also. Underline that third verse because it tells us something about Jesus. And what it tells us about Jesus is, and you never can, you ought not to ever forget it, and I know you won't, is that Jesus loves us. He loves us. Turn to your neighbor behind you, look him in the eye and shake their hand and, and ask them, what is your name? Look him in the eye and say, what is your name? Turn to your neighbor, I'll, I'll find an empty chair and turn to the empty chair and say, what's in there? Say, what's your name, neighbor? Now turn back to them and say, neighbor, Never forget that no matter what happens to you, say no matter what sickness you have, say no matter what problem you have, no matter what issue you have, no matter what goes on in your life, no matter how far you move away from God, that God still loves you. Say, say you've got to remember that, that God is a loving God 
who always love us. Now turn back to him and say, when your family doesn't love you anymore, God still loves you. I'm talking to somebody in the back. When your friends start to be hating on you, God still loves you. I, I wish I had a witness in the house. When I go astray, God is like the father in the prodigal son. God stands there waiting with his arms outstretched looking for me to return back home. God still loves me. Doesn't matter what I'm wearing today, how I'm dressed today, God still loves me. I didn't wear my Sunday going meeting suit today, but God still loves me. Sometimes I'm thinking the wrong thing, but God still loves me. That's important for you. Never forget God loves you. And if God loves you, he's always going to take care of you. He will never abandon you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never turn his back on you. God still, I wish I could take that home. God still loves us. And the Bible says there's a soul love in the love that God so loves us. Don't ever forget that word soul, which means that it is unmeasurable. It is unlimited that God loves you. And here, here's the tripping thing about it, Reverend Rivers, that while I was yet messed up, while I was yet headed down the wrong road, while I was yet thinking the wrong thought last night, God, he ain't like some folk. You messed up just a little bit and some folk will drop you. But not so with God. God, while I was yet sinner, Christ died for me. Gave himself for me. Sacrificed himself for me. And I'm like the other folk who ask, what manner of love is this? Maybe you ain't got no sins. Maybe you haven't done anything wrong. Maybe you're perfect. But remember from which you've come in spite of it all. God never gave up on us. That he loved Lazarus. You know when you love somebody nobody needs to tell you any other thing about the person the text says that that the sisters send to Jesus a message and the message was real simple master the one you love is very much so the one you love so very much is sick now now here, here, here's the rift in the text is is that God's going to do something Jesus is going to do something intentional God's going to do something intentional and it ain't going to jive with the sisters y'all need to hear this y'all know the story there's going to be something that's going to happen in the text that I already told you that he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus that, that whenever he needed a break he would go down five miles south of the city of Jerusalem to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus there in Bethany and, 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 but he's going to do something that ain't going to jive I wish I had time to preach it that ain't going to jive with the girls there are sometimes God does things to us and with us that it just doesn't jive with us I, I, wish I, I wish I had a witness today. Sometimes I don't want to walk down your alley. I don't want to go down your boulevard, but at the end of the day, there sometimes God does things to us that just doesn't jive with us. You need to get that. There's sometimes, but, 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 but the 
songwriter said you can't hurry God oh no you just gotta wait give him time no matter how long it takes he's a God you can't I wish I could preach to somebody today he's a God you can't hurry don't you worry he may not come when you want him but hey he's always is there a witness who know about the always always on time God he's going to do something here that doesn't jive with him in verse 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 the one whom you love is very sick and when Jesus got the message he said this sickness is not fatal it will become an occasion to show God's mm, mm, mm. whatever is going in your life just remember it ain't fatal oh I, I know I'm preaching too long here if it ain't fatal it also means it ain't final God always have another chapter. It never ends with the end as in the case of the book. God always has another paragraph. God always has another sentence. God always has another continuation. Whatever you go through, it ain't always fatal. And it ain't fatal. And if it ain't fatal, thank God it ain't final. If I have a problem, if I have a concern, if this happens to me, just remember, it ain't fatal. And if it ain't fatal, it ain't final because God always has something else to say. He says in the Message Bible, Eugene Peterson, in verse 4, this sickness is not fatal. Your text says not unto death. It will become an occasion to show God's glory by glorifying God's son. Which means that when God does something for you, when God brings you out of something that was not fatal, then it's for you to glorify his son. In other words, if God woke you up this morning and started you on your way, and if you're still in your right mind, you ought to glorify God's son. You ought to say thank you, Jesus. That's why you can't come a whole week and not stop in church and say thank you, Jesus, because the Lord has been, as the old folks said, better to us than we've been to our own selves. And so we ought to glorify, here it is, God's son. We ought to say thank you, Jesus, because after all, God has committed everything in the hands of his son Jesus and the mediator between man and God, God and man is Jesus and so if you have good etiquette and ethics when somebody does something good for you you ought to come back and say thank you Jesus can you stand on your feet and give God about 10 seconds of thank you Jesus thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus thank you Jesus, glorifying God's son. Boy, that was pretty weak. That was pretty. It's getting a little stronger. It's getting a little stronger. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. You know what he's done for you. You know what you've asked him to do for you. You've asked him to do some things in the future. And so you better give him some glorified. Glorify his son, Jesus. You got to thank him for not only for yesterday, today, but also what he's going to do for you on tomorrow. Is there anybody in the house need God to do something for them in the tomorrow? Oh, I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to praise him while I have the chance because I may not have this chance again come on praise team I may not have this chance again Lazarus is sick Mary, who saw the miracle of Jesus earlier, and Martha, sent a messenger. Jesus, 
the one whom you love is sick. Don't tell Jesus anything else. Just tell him that the one you love, Lazarus, is sick. What the messengers don't know is that Lazarus had already died. The Bible says that Jesus delayed his going there to Bethany for two more days. It had been two days to get there, so it was four days he was already dead. When he comes, let me make a long story short. When he comes, his sister say, Lord, if you had been there, our brother would have not died. What they do not understand is that sometimes God has an intentional plan for each of us. He has a plan for Lazarus. He's got a plan for Mary. He's got a plan for Martha. And he is intentional. You got to get this. For the personalized plan of each of us. What God has for you may not be what God has for me. And whatever God send me through, he may not send you through, but sometimes he may send you through what he will not send me through. I don't have time to tell you, but God is intentional. He delays his time because Lazarus is already dead. He says to his disciple, you know, Lazarus is asleep. And his disciple says, well, if he's asleep, you know, he'll wake up. And then finally in the text, he says very plainly, Jesus said very plainly, Unto them, Lazarus is dead. But this death, he's going to say in the text, for Lazarus is for the glory of God. What do you mean, Jesus? He shall rise again. And so he's going to be all right. Here again. There are things that God does to us just doesn't jive with us. Why would you allow him to die? He's already dead. I've allowed him to die and he's already dead in the mind of God so that I can raise him up again, give him a new life again. Sometimes God allows things to occur in our lives for us to go through certain kinds of things so that he can let us know that he's the resurrection, resurrected Lord and he can raise up a situation. He can raise up a dead family. He can raise up an ugly character. He can raise up an ugly past. He can raise up some dis uh, friend. He can raise up. So I got a plan for him. Why are y'all upset? Don't worry about Lazarus. Worry about yourselves because I got a plan for Lazarus. He shall rise again. Lazarus, come forth. The text says he comes forth. That's good. Now y'all been going through all this stuff against me. Talking about if I had been there. Don't you know I never was not there. I was never not there. Because I told you the messengers that only had to let me know that the one whom you love and if I love him I'm never going to leave him I'm never going to forsake him I'm never going to allow them to go through a valley by themselves I will resurrect Lazarus who is already dead y'all don't understand criticizing me if I had not been there your brother wouldn't have died. But if I had not been there, if I had not been there, I could not have been there then when he needed to be resurrected. I got a plan for him. And I got a plan for y'all. Y'all gonna see me at my best. Where 
Is he laying? Where? Come here. Come here, Lazarus. Lay down there. Where does he lay? Where is he at? He's dead. He's in a sepulchre. Show me where he's at. I don't need to do any marvelous work. I don't need to do doctrine or theology. All I got to do is say a word. Lazarus, come forth. Hey. That's all he has to do to your situation. Just say a word. You got cancer? Let him say a word. You got financial problems? Let him say a word. Let him say a word over your problem. Turns around and says, I am the resurrection. Let me not leave you on a low note. Well, most of us are going to the graveyard today. And the truth of the matter is, ain't nobody there. Ain't nobody there. Because Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord the afterlife Mary says I know that he shall rise again in the latter day of the final resurrection we've been teaching that for a long time so if he's going to rise again Jesus it must going to be millenniums from now Jesus said you don't understand I am the resurrection. I'm here right now. Though he was dead, as I would be, he is alive forevermore. Give God some praise right there as we bow our heads in a word of thanks unto God. Take the person by the hand next to you. Pray that God will put into their spirit that whatever they're going through and whatever they go through, God is intentional. And it may not jive with them. But their problem is not fatal. If it's not fatal, it's not final. Which means that you can come out of this thing. For Lazarus, he came out of it. Mary and Martha saw their brother Lazarus. They came out of their depression. Jesus says, it's so that you might glorify God's son, Jesus. Listen to me, my friend. Satan wants to keep you where you're at. But God wants to resurrect you out of it. God wants to change your mind. He wants to change your thoughts. In, in fact, he says it this way. Let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. When you got the mind of Christ in you, we've been man do it for a night. But you know joy is coming in the morning. When you've got the mind of Jesus, things that you want to do you don't do things you ought not to do you you really are hesitant in doing those things God makes a change in your life and you've come in here to this church on this memorial weekend it's a good time to give your life to the Lord because he wants to let you know I resurrect things you say well Reverend you don't understand what I've been doing lately my response to you is, you don't know what we all have been doing lately. And the truth of the matter is, you're not in the house as a sinful person or a sinner or a wrongdoer or a mistaken person, whatever. You are in good company. Why, if we sit down and have a debate over who's the worst sinner in the house, I guarantee you that everybody in this church would no doubt beat you 
in sharing with you the things that they've done in their lives in the wrong way. And so what Jesus wants you to do, he said, don't worry about that. You've got to be somewhere. You've got to be somewhere where I am. You've got to be somewhere where I speak a word on Sunday morning. You've got to be somewhere where, where you're covered all week long, where if you go down through the valley called the shadow of death, as one of our mothers did just the other day, Mother Jenkins, 95 years old, she was here on Mother's Day and she stood up and said she was 95 and I went down and hugged her and her family said she just felt the presence of God when that happened and here it is a few weeks later she has gone on to glory. I visited her the other day as she was transitioning out and I said, baby doll, no, honey, I said, mother, you're getting ready to take another journey. I said, don't worry about it because never forget, Jesus is always with you. But it's only because she accepted Jesus as the Lord and her Savior. Jesus will always be with you unless you put him out of your house, unless you put him out of your heart. That's why we got some kids who are so in left field, some seniors who are all messed up, some folk who are just living ugly lives. It's because, it's not because Jesus does not want to be there, but rather they have put Jesus out. Not so like Lazarus, Mouth, Martha, and Mary. Jesus wants you. He wants to be in your life. As you bow your heads, would you repeat this prayer after me? Say, dear God, thank you for being in my life. Say, God, there are some times I do have problems with some things you tell me. But I know now that you are intentional in what you do in my life. And God, I want to glorify Jesus because he is my savior. He died for me, rose for me in my heart right now. Thank you, Jesus.